But before we begin in God's word, let's, let's have a moment of prayer. Lord, we, we come to you this morning. We, we are grateful. I pray that we're grateful. We're grateful, Lord, for the opportunity that we get to come and we get to sing about you. To we, we get to sing about longing for the consummation, the wedding feast that we celebrate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We, we have a foretaste through the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit and the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. There is a foretaste in us of what we will experience at the consummation when we are clothed with a body that can inherit immortality. And we long for that day. And so we sing, even so, come, Lord Jesus. And while we're here, Lord, while we're waiting and longing for that day, help us to be obedient servants. Help us to, to worship you, Lord, every day, every second. May we think of how we can worship you, how we can glorify you. Lord, we pray that this time now that we open your word and and seek to understand it in greater ways that it will cause our knowledge of you to increase and that our, our lifestyle will be in a manner worthy of our Savior. We thank you, Lord, for this time you give us each week. Lord, help us to not take it for granted, the gathering of the saints. We, we, we look upon one another, we sing and and hear each other's voices, Lord, and it stirs us to love and good works. And we need that stirring. So thank you, Lord. Thank you. We pray this in, in the wonderful name of Christ, who is King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. So we're in 1 Peter chapter 3 again this week. And last week, we looked at Christian conduct that is attractive. We started looking at verse 8 through 12. Um, Peter has already told wives how they can adorn themselves with a beauty that is imperishable. And here in verse 8 and 9, he is telling every Christian how they can adorn themselves with an attractiveness that will cause people to ask us for the reason we have the hope that we have. Now, what kind of person is a verse 8 person? That's what we looked at last week, and I want to just briefly summarize what kind of person this is in verse 8. Let me read verse 8 through 12 here. He says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. A verse 8 Christian is one, someone who is born again. Someone who is born again. It is someone who's not only born again, but he, he or she loves God's word and submits to it as their ultimate authority. God's word must be our ultimate authority. It is a person who desires to follow the example of Christ, right? That's what Peter's telling us here. It is someone who desires to follow the example of Christ while trusting completely in the person and work of Christ. They can think of themselves, this is a person who can think of themselves in the situations that others are going through, whether they're suffering or sinning, and reaches out to them to help bear their burden. This is a person who loves others, especially their brothers and sisters in Christ, and that love cannot help but be expressed in concrete, tangible ways. Because love, true biblical love, always expresses itself. 
in tangible ways. And we see that in the cross of Jesus Christ. This is the person who is not only sympathetic to others' needs, but makes an effort. This is the tender-hearted word here. They're not only sympathetic, but they're looking. They're people who are looking for people that may be in need. Looking for people that they may be able to help in some way. And this is a person who puts others first. Willing to sacrifice preference if something else is more beneficial to others. This is the kind of person that we have here in verse 8 that Peter is commanding us to be. This is the kind of person that God calls us to be on a daily basis. Now, I, I think that we, we fail at this often. Amen? And that's why it's so important that, and Paul tells us that we, we have to die daily in order to live the way God calls us to live. This may be easier for us to do when, when we just finish singing hymns, right? Um, we we kind of get in that worshipful mood. We've, we've sang some glorious songs. We've been led by talented musicians to sing glorious songs about an even glory, more glorious God. And, and sometimes it's easier maybe in, in here or maybe even right after we leave to, to live out verse 8. But when we wake up Monday morning and have to go to work, or start dealing with the, the children, or whatever it may be, it becomes much harder to do that. So what if, what if, what if we're being treated with hostility, right? It's, it's, easy, it's easier, I think, to, to live out verse 8 if, if we're being hospitable to one another, if we're being kind Right? But what about if we're being treated with hostility? Because Peter addresses that here. He says, do not repay, in verse 9, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, bless. Man, if he, hadn't just, if he just hadn't said that, right? I mean, it's, a one, it's one thing to, to build up maybe uh, enough to walk away from being reviled, right? Someone reviles you, someone does evil to you, and you just say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what James says, I'm not going to speak, right? I'm going to be slow to speak, I'm going to walk away from this. But that's not all we're commanded to do here. We're not just commanded to walk away from being reviled. We're not just commanded to, to not return evil for evil. On the contrary, we are to return evil and reviling with blessings. I mean, think about that. Just think about that for a moment. Think about your tendencies. Think about your temperament. Think about the temptations in your life when people do this. And think about how you want to respond. And sometimes we respond in the wrong way. And sometimes we maybe withstand responding the, the wrong way, but we don't follow it up with responding the right way. It's a difference. There's a difference here. This, this, listen, this is a hard saying. This is a hard saying. This, this kind of saying right here is is the kind of saying that causes people to walk away from Jesus. When we think about someone, someone who is purposefully trying to do evil to you, they are, they're purposefully slandering you, trying to slander and, and make bad on your character, your reputation. They're making false accusations against you, against you in order to discredit you in the eyes of others. And God says, don't just walk away from that. Retaliate with blessing. What, what do you do when people do that? 
We, we know what the temptation is, right? I mean, do, do you retaliate? Do you, do you, here's what pops in our mind. I'll teach them a lesson on who not to mess with, right? If we're being honest, I'll teach them a lesson on who, who not to mess with. Or I'll, I'll, I'll one-up them. This, this, is, this is what we see on the playgrounds of every school, every playground in the neighborhood, when kids start getting in arguments. What, what happens? If when you, all the stuff you've been watching, what happens even in adults is someone says something and someone says something back and we just keep one-upping one another until it's, right, blows are being thrown and then weapons are being pulled out and then it ends horrifically. I'll one-up them. I'll teach them who not to mess with. In other words, do you seek vengeance? Do you seek vengeance when you are done wrong or do you seek reconciliation? We all know what our natural response is. I think all of us have failed at this miserably in, in certain points in our life and we're still probably failing at it at, at times. We all know what the natural response is, but here's the thing. Our calling, Peter says, is not to a natural response. On the contrary, our calling is to bless. We have been, Peter says here, called to this. Our calling is, a, is to have a supernatural response, a response that the world can't explain. Our calling is one in which we respond in a way that is inexplicable to the unbelieving mind. They can't explain it. And, and here's the point. Believers are to be a blessing to all people at all times, whether in response to evil or not. That's our calling. We are to be a blessing to all people in all times, whether in response to evil or not. Now, here, here's the question that, that I pose for us. How can we do this? <laughs> How can we do this? How is any of this possible? When you look at verse 9 and you read it and you say, I, I just don't know. I'm, I'm not naturally gifted at verse 9. How, how can I do this? How is any of this possible? Well, the first step in obeying verse 9 is being a person of verse 8. The first step of being a, obeying verse 9 is being a person of verse 8, which we looked at last week. You will never be the person that verse 9 is calling to you to be if you are not pursuing to be the person of verse 8. If you do not regard God's word as your ultimate authority, you will never heed the command to love your neighbor as yourself. If you do not have sympathy and a tender heart, you will never place yourself in the offender's shoes. And you'll never have patience toward them or pity towards them in their spiritual blindness. You'll never pray for them if you're not the person of verse 8. You'll never pray that God will do a mighty work in their heart because they're lost and they're, they're living as lost people can only live. If you don't have a humble mind, you will never think of yourself as the Apostle Paul to be the chief of sinners. Right? I mean, we, we I think we, we forget that there go I, except by the grace of God. And we think somehow that we are who we are in Christ because of sola bootstrapsa, one of my friends says, <laughs> right? That's the sixth sola you're not aware of, right? That somehow our Christian sanctification is because we pull up our bootstraps and get to it. Our sanctification is by the grace of God, even though we pursue it. 
It's by the grace and mercy of God. Remember Philippians, he works in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. And when we think sola bootstrapsa, we can look down our nose on other people that aren't doing it quite the way we're doing it. But when we think, there go I, except by the grace of God, we can put ourselves in their shoes and say, if I had the life they had, I could very easily do what they're doing right now, except by the grace of God and the mercy of God in my life to regenerate me and to quicken me to life. I'd be going down the same path they're going. So Lord, help me to have mercy on them because you've had mercy on me. And if we're not the person of verse 8, we can never obey the command here in verse 9. Do not repay evil for, e for evil or reviling for re reviling, but on the contrary, bless. Right? Man, if it was just, if it was just walk away. But we're called to return evil with blessing. He, he doesn't just call us to not retaliate. Which, by the way, is hard enough to do. It's hard enough to do to not retaliate. But God, God calls us to return evil done to us with blessings to the evildoer. Now, how can someone repay evil done to them? I've kind of alluded to it, and I just, I just want to bring it to, to a conclusion here. Maybe make it a little more clear. How can someone, how can, how can we, how can I repay evil done to me with blessing to the evildoer? And I think, I think it's by re rem reminding ourselves where our value comes from. Right? Now, what do I mean by that? What does, what does seeing our source of value do to help us not repay evil with evil? Okay? What does seeing our, our true source of value do to help us not repay evil with evil? Well, here's what's happening. Here's why we want to return evil with evil. Here's, we want to, here's why we want to return reviling with reviling. Here's why we want to retaliate. Because when we're attacked verbally, when we're slandered, when we're reviled, what props itself up immediately is our flesh. And our flesh tells us this, that our sense of self-worth and our sense of self-value is being attacked. And we're immediately tricked into thinking that somehow our value is in ourself rather than Jesus. So we're, we're, we're immediately driven down the wrong path here. Because our flesh, who, who is a, a very bad defense lawyer, props itself up and tells us, hey, your self-value is being attacked. Your dignity is being attacked here, and you need to stand up, and you need to defend it in this courtroom right now. We feel as though we're being devalued. We feel as though we are being stripped of our self-worth. We feel as though we are being cast in a, in a way that is less than we deserve. And we forget where our true value comes from. The dignity of a human being comes from the fact that we are created in the image of God. That image being restored through the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit and the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in our life. The value that we have is that we are being transformed into the image of His beloved Son. The value that we have, real value, will pass the grave. And the only real value that we have that will pass the grave is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And yet when we are devalued or slandered or reviled, our, our flesh props, up, props itself up immediately as a defense attorney to trick us into thinking that somehow we have value in ourselves and we must defend it to the death. And we have to resist that. And we have to remember Ephesians 2, that, that we once walked according to the power of our flesh and according to the prince of the power of the air, following the lust of our flesh. And we were by nature children of wrath. 
God didn't look down and save us because he saw something worth saving. He didn't see value in us, and that's why he quickened us. It was mercy. It was grace. It was undeserved. And we have to remember where our true value comes from. I mean, the reality of it is somebody, somebody says something bad about me, honestly, I can say, man, you don't know the half of it. You haven't seen my heart. You don't know the thoughts that pop up in my mind that scare me, right? You don't know what I'm capable of. Outside of the grace of God, you have no idea how evil I could be. But my value is not in who, what I can do, or in self. My value is in Jesus. And that value passes the grave. That value lasts. Moth can't eat it, rust can't destroy it, and thief can't steal it. Amen. And then we think not only of where our true value comes from, but then we think of what Christ endured, who actually did have true value. Who being the eternal Son of God incarnate, was beaten until he couldn't be recognized, mocked, spit upon. He was worthy of every. Every being and creature that took breath, he was worthy of us falling on our knees and worshiping him. Yet he didn't have a place to lay his head. They attempted to throw him off the cliff and stone him. They nailed him to a cross. They mocked him, made fun of him. And he was one who actually did have inherent value. Infinite value value and we're told he could have called a legion of angels at any time why can why why can we not repay evil done to us with good how can we do that we have to remember where our true value comes from and we have to remember the, remember the example of Christ. If Christ, who is infinitely valuable, could walk before his accusers and not utter a word, and walk to the cross, and bear the sins of his people that he did not commit, how much more can we do that? Another question. Why repay evil done to me with blessings for the evildoer. Why repay evil done to me with blessings for the evildoer? Just, just some extra reasons. Number one, the believer is bearing testimony to man's need to escape the corruption by turning to Jesus Christ and his righteousness. That's what we're bearing testimony to. We're bearing testimony to man's need to escape the corruption of this world by turning to Jesus Christ and his righteousness. So, so what does that mean? That means we're not to bear witness to finding our ultimate justice in this world because this world cannot give us ultimate justice. We're not to bear witness to the need for vengeance in order to prop up our perceived self-value the, for the world to see because as we said a moment ago, our value is in Jesus Christ. But Peter gives us another reason here. He says, not only, not only that, but he also gives us another re reason that you may obtain God's blessing. You see that here in verse 9? Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. Now, it's important that we understand what this means. This is... This is not a works-based salvation statement. God has ordained, according to the Bible, God has ordained that our obedience to him gives him opportunity to lavish blessings upon us. Do you hear me? The Bible teaches us that God has ordained that our obedience to him gives him opportunity to lavish blessings upon us. Now, I know the hesitation that's going on maybe in your mind right now. 
We, we want to hesitate and we want to question that thought be, and, and we want to think, man, is this, this sounds health and wealth to me. But I assure you it's not. Here, here's the health, wealth, and prosperity movement has taken the truth that God blesses obedience and it has distorted it into an obligation to put upon God to bless us in the way we see fit. That's the difference. Now, when it, whenever a doctrine is distorted, we, we're almost squeamish to even talk about it. But the Bible teaches us that God blesses obedience. And what a gracious thing for him to do. Amen? The way it's distorted is by saying that somehow we can obey and we can obligate God to give us what we want rather than what he deems necessary. You see the difference? It is not biblical to say that I can obey and then God is obligated to give me what I want in this moment, the way I want it. However, it is biblical, it is biblical to say God blesses our obedience because God tells us that he blesses his children's obedience. And he also chastises us when we disobey, right? Husbands, if you're not loving your wife the way God has called you to love your wife, your prayers will be hindered. And if you're loving your wife the way you're supposed to love your wife, guess what? Your prayers will not be hindered. So God brings blessing and chastisement upon his children. He does it for perfect reasons and in his perfect timing. And the blessings can be whatever he sees fit for the good of our sanctification and the glory of his name. And the blessing ultimately flows from the grace of God. Here, here's how gracious God is. God regenerates us. He takes the heart of stone out, gives us a heart of flesh, gives us the Holy Spirit who lives within us and works in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. And then because of his grace in all that work, we obey him and he blesses us for obeying him, which is the, an expression of the work of the Holy Spirit in us. How gracious is that? And this is exactly why Peter um, quotes here Psalm 34, 12 through 16. Because he's teaching us here that, that our obedient living gives God an opportunity and to bless us. Now, I want to read. Let's just read 10 through 12, and then I'll, I'll say a few things, and then we'll, we'll look at Psalm 34, which is what Peter's quoting here. 10 through 12, 1 Peter 3. Because, for, because, right? For to this you have been called, that you may obtain a blessing, because whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. There is a theme here in Psalm 34, and it is a theme that we've been looking at here in 1 Peter. And here's the theme. The theme in Psalm 34 is the fear of the Lord. Okay, or, or you could say the worship of the Lord. Or you could say trusting in the Lord. It's the same as what Peter has been calling being mindful of God. Being mindful of God. Or, as in the example of Christ, continually entrusting yourself to God. The Bible tells us repeatedly that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fearing the Lord has multiple aspects to it, but its central idea is focusing on the Lord alone, looking to the Lord alone, being afraid of the Lord alone, trusting in the Lord alone, following the Lord alone, obeying the Lord alone, and loving the Lord alone. And this is the key to living the Christian life. Now, let's, let's look at the quoted verse plus the one prior, which is verse 11. I want to read Psalm 34, 11 through 16. He quotes 12 through 16, but I want to add 11 to it. Because it's an introduction to 12 through 16. 
The psalmist says this, Come, old children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Or I will teach you the worship of the Lord. And then he says this, What man is there who desires life and loves many days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. These commands are based on the Lord's own blessing of those who do right. Do you see that? The, 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 psalm, the psalmist is saying, listen, who wants to live a pretty peaceful life? Who, who wants to live a life that is, is not full of calamity? Well, then obey the Lord. Because there is a general principle taught in the Word of God that if you're pursuing a life that is in obedience to God, you will have a life that is less filled with evil and less filled with calamity and less filled with problems. It's not every scenario, but generally speaking. That's the principle. God gives a general principle for living. And if you live the way God calls us to live, children, obey your parents so that your days may be long in the land. Right? Your days may be long and good in the land of the living, on earth. And so God is, is t saying here in Psalm 34, this is how you have, generally speaking, this is how you have a good life. This is how you have a life that's, that's pretty filled with peace and good. And God God's blessings are on those who seek to live this kind of life in his opposition. He is in opposition to those who do contrary. Who wants to live a long life filled with good? Then remember verses 13 to 14, right, of Psalm 34. Live a life of obedience to God. Obey his commands. And remember this foundational truth that is found in verse 15 and 16 of Psalm 34. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. In other words, how, how do we not retaliate against sinful behavior with sinful behavior? Because we trust God to make things right. That we cannot make things right. We can't do it. We don't have enough information to make things right. The way God can make things right. Who knows the end from the beginning. He knows every single, let's just call the evildoer opposition. He knows what that opposer, right? He knows what the opposition needs. He knows what they've been through. And he knows his plans for them the rest of their life. We have no idea when it comes to that. And so we can't bring justice upon that person like God can because God knows the end from the beginning. And so we entrust ourselves, like the example of Christ earlier in, the, in 1 Peter, we entrust ourselves to God. So we trust, our ultimate trust is not in that we can set things right, but that God will eventually and perfectly. And so we leave justice to him. And we entrust ourselves to God. It's, it's easier said than done. All, all these traits work together to train us to follow the example of Christ. And when, we, when, when these traits are working together within us, they enable us to do this. To, it enables the believer to bear testimony to the corruption of the world and to God's salvation. Evil doing is a corruption of God's original design for creation. And to bless the evil doer is to express that vengeance will not fix this. Right? 
When we seek vengeance, we're expressing that we think vengeance will fix this. When we trust God for justice, we express a trust in him and we express that vengeance will not fix our problem. Only God can fix it and we trust him to do so. And so we follow Christ's example. That's what verse 9 takes us back to. It takes us back to chapter 2, verse 23. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And that's the key is to continue to entrust ourselves to him who judges justly. So the only way to obey the command in verse 9 is to be pursuing to be the person of verse 8 and trusting and putting your hope in God and entrusting yourself to God in every circumstance. Because, listen, our circumstances, when, when circumstances come upon us, and, and rather than retaliate or seek vengeance, we entrust ourselves to God. We have just worshipped. It may not be the, the same kind of worship when we're singing songs together here on Sunday morning, but when we entrust ourselves to God, rather, rather than entrusting ourselves to self, or entrusting ourselves to the, the, what the sin nature is, is tempting us to do, when we resist temptation and we entrust ourselves to God, what we've just done is we've worshipped him. And that's what we're called to do. We've just worshipped him. No one may have ever seen it. It may have been a moment of silent prayer in your heart, but you just resisted temptation and entrusted yourself to God. And what just occurred in your heart was worship of the creator. And when we conduct ourselves as we're instructed to, uh, to conduct ourselves here, we will adorn ourselves with an attractiveness to the world. They, they won't understand it. They, they won't be able to explain it, but they'll be curious to know why and how we can behave in such a way. And we adorn the doctrine of God when we live in such a way. And to those who are being saved, listen, it will be a sweet smelling aroma. And may God have mercy on us and empower us to live this way according to his word. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. It ch it's challenging, Lord, and it's something that we can't do on our own. We, we can't pull our bootstraps up and, and obey these commands. We need to depend upon you and be prayerful in, in our circumstances and lean upon the Holy Spirit and, and pray and hide your word against in our heart that we might not sin against you and, and to f know where our true value comes from and to entrust ourselves to you and not to the justice that we can give, which is not really justice at all. Help us to live in such a way that we're a sweet-smelling aroma of the gospel and that we're living in such a way that it is an attractant to the gospel. And we pray all this in the name of Christ so that we can honor Christ with our life, so that we can honor you with how we live and how we speak. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lyndon's going to come and lead us in the Lord's Supper.